Hi everyone, uh, this is the second episode of uh, the five factor model in the personality traits. It's called agreeableness. And why is that important to understand what agreeableness is? Well, agreeable persons like popularity, basically. And when we studied, when scientists have studied agreeableness, women are more agreeable than men. And the reason for that, they claim, is that when a woman goes through puberty, she's primed for having children. And by doing that, the personality trait becomes agreeable. Why, you might ask yourself? Well, it forms very natural that a woman should be agreeable towards an infant. So, therefore, evolution has made women agreeable and not questioning an infant at the first 18 months. It would be quite hard if a woman starts to question a child, an infant, when it screams, it cries, it wants something, it needs the diaper change or whatever. So therefore, evolution has made women more agreeable. Of course, there's downsides to being agreeable, which we can see in society, but I'm going to try and explain more in, in depth what agreeableness is and why it's important for you to understand what it's all about so that you can question yourself so that you don't suffer in society. You need to understand that society is a social construct, a game, and people are in fact very much social. We uh, clean out the bad things, what we say, so that to please others. Good example is that when you fall in love, when you're attracted to a person, then you are subdued by the halo effect. It doesn't matter what another person, the other person does, you'll still love them and agree with them. That's a problem, especially if that person, woman or man, it is of bad nature with in fact bad values. And speaking of values, just to get your attention when it comes to why personality is so important, it's been tested throughout psychology in regards to personality traits and values. Is it the values that shape the personality? Or is it the personality that in fact shapes your values? Well, there is science that supports both theories. The latest one I read about supports that the personality actually shapes your values. And I'll get to that when it comes to neuroticism and how hard it is for a neurotic person to have good values because the pain circuit will tell you what your value, values should be in order to survive in that environment that your personality is shaping for you. Anyhow, let's get back to agreeableness. And I will read some just to get the full essence of uh, the trait so that I don't skew the actual information about it. So here it goes. Agreeableness reflects individual differences in concern with cooperation and social harmony. Agreeable individuals value getting along with others. They are therefore considerate, friendly, generous, helpful, and willing to compromise their interests with others. Keep that in mind. They are willing to compromise their interests in a group of other people. And I'll get back to why that's important to understand that effect. Agreeable people also have an optimistic view of human nature. They believe people are basically honest, decent, and trustworthy. Disagreeable people, however, place self-interests above getting along with others. They're generally unconcerned with others' well-being and therefore are unlikely to extend themselves for other people. Sometimes their skepticism about others motivates, causes them to 
be suspicious, unfriendly and uncooperative. Agreeableness is obviously advantageous for attaining and maintaining popularity. And agreeable people are better liked than disagreeable people. And you see that in social media. You get your social gatherings and people in your workplace, in, in your friend's circle, do agree with some people more. And that's a known human trait called uh, the need to belong. And that's very, that's one of the strongest drives in humanity, the need to belong. And I'll make a video about that later on. That is quite important to understand and how intricate that drive is in humans. On the other hand, agreeableness is not very useful when it comes to a um, situation that requires both uh, tough, absolute, objective decisions. Did you hear that? Objective decisions. You're not objecting objective when you agree to other people's opinions and what they want. Disagreeable people can make excellent scientists, critics, soldiers, police officers, and I think you get the meaning. But you can also see that uh, politicians need to be both agreeable to their own party and disagreeable to others. So they have a more complex environment to, to work in, uh, but it's easy for them since it would be very hard not to be a narcissist and be a politician because you will end up mentally ill and get, uh, in, get out of it pretty quickly if you're not a narcissist because you, you, you can't cope in that environment if you're not. Simple as that. There's a reason why good people aren't politicians. And there's a reason why good people aren't uh, aren't interacting with bad people because it's it's harmful for them. But we were talking about subcategories and the subcategories of agreeableness are trust, morality, altruism, cooperation, modesty and sympathy. Not empathy, but sympathy. They differ, so don't get them mixed up. What is trust? Well, a person with high trust assumes that most people are fair, honest, and have a good intention. Persons low on trust see others as selfish, devious, and potentially dangerous. I, for example, have been raised, the, I am a good example of environment's effect. Through my upbringing and through the relationships I've had previous to this one, which hasn't been good, uh, narcissism has been in context there, I've learned to watch myself and understand that people aren't honest, people aren't genuine, people aren't good people just by someone saying that they are. They're not because we're human. Humanity isn't always fair. It's about survival in many cases. And people that are insecure, which is correlated to uh, neuroticism, the pain circuit, will try and survive. And in that problematic personality trait, they become bad people when it suits them. And that trait also forms their values in some regard. So you need to pay attention to that and understand that humanity isn't kind. You need to learn and read up on these traits and, and why people are the way they are. They're not necessarily bad people um, altogether, but you need to understand that humans have good sides and they have bad sides. Yin and Yang, for example. I bet you're all wrong when it comes to what, what type of gender the black side is of the yin and yang and what's the white side. Here's a news flash for you. Females, femininity, isn't white. 
It's the black part, and it stands for chaos. And we know that. And I'll come back to that why that is. Um, so the world, you need to pay attention to that the world doesn't describe things the way it should be. You need actually to start reading up and learning about how complex humans are and the world that we live in. And we haven't even barely scratched on the surface yet. Here comes the second subcategory of agreeableness. It's called morality. And high scores on this um, subcategory scale sees no need uh, for pretense or manipulation when dealing with other people and are therefore candid, frank and sincere. However, low scores uh, believe that a certain amount of deception in social relationships is necessary. People find it relatively easy to relate to straightforward high, high scores on their scales. They generally find it more difficult to relate to the unstraightforward low scores on this scale. It should be made clear that low scores are not unprincipled or immoral. They are simply more guarded, less willing to open, openly reveal the whole truth. Uh, so you shouldn't, what they are implying is that you shouldn't judge a person just because their morality is low. And you shouldn't judge yourself in a bad manner if your morality is very low. Well, you can guess what I am. I'm not high, I'm not middle. I know what people are, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Throughout my life, I've, I've been a manager. I've coached people for the past, what is it, 21 years now? And my previous profession have been in the public sector, having um, confidentiality talks with strangers, basically, in my profession. And just in the last 10 and a half years, I've done 8,000 hours talking in confidentiality with people. And during confidentiality sessions, people tend to open up pretty good, even though there's a social filter to it. But people do tend to speak about the truth and I'll be assessing mentally mental disorders and physical uh, problems with a person to assess whether or not they're fit for some sort of labor that they want to go into or have current knowledge about. So when I speak about this I do have some sort of um, understanding about people since I've met so many under confidentiality and made an assessment of them which was my profession so I'm not speaking in as someone that has been a welder for 20 years and not spoken to another person so you understand where I'm coming from the third one is called altruism the subcategory and altruistic people find helping others uh, generally rewarding and consequently, they're gener generally willing to assist those who are in need. Altruistic people find that doing things for others is a form of self-fulfillment rather than self-sacrifice. And here's my take on it. Altruistic people are in themselves egotistical being altruistic, but because they are doing it for self-fulfillment, so that they feel good about themselves. That has nothing to do, would I argue, to extending themselves to others purely from a perspective of as being there for someone else. Because in the end, it's coming back to, I feel good about myself, for doing that for that person and people you can see that people that are altruistic it doesn't mean that they are a good person or have good values because they might be doing that to feel good about themselves in order to cover up the bad things they've done in other places and if you meet a lot of people you'll see that that's very common 
It's a self, it's a sort of a survival mechanism. In order not, not to go insane and realize and having to fess up with being a dishonest, a bad person, they do small things for other people to conceal their badness, so to speak. So don't think, take altruism as being purely good. However, low scores on their scales do not particularly like helping those in need. They're just honest about it. <laughs> A request for help feels like an imposition in, in rather than an opportunity for self-fulfillment. And I'm sky high in this. Um, we're not going to get into why, but I'm almost 100. I'm 98. I love helping other people. This is what I'm doing right now. I'm doing it because I'm also training to talk to a camera, which is quite fun, and I like to talk about things that are, are that interest me. But I also have a center core value in life, in that during my 8,000 hours at the Swedish Public Employment Service, I love helping people genuinely. I also feel good about it, so the self-fulfillment is there, but through the lens of a camera or through my other profession as a UX designer, I can reach digitally thousands of more people and helping them, not telling them how to think, but to question themselves in order to become better people and to adjust in the world in a better, in a better manner and feel better about themselves and lead better lives and having better relationships. And I'm going to talk about relationships further on in, in other videos. And I'm also going to talk about there is science that banks what women and men are attracted to. And you yourself can actually put out a me tape measure and measure if you're attractive or not, whether you're a male or a female. It's not hard, it's math. And it's proven through time and through uh, eight th different ways, I reckon. I think. However, fourth, cooperation. Individuals who score high, score high on this scale dislike confrontations. They are perfectly willing to compromise or deny their own needs in order to get along with others. Those who score low on this scale are more likely to intimidate other people to get their way. I can intimidate if I feel it necessary to question your belief in something so that you raise your eyes to a, 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 to a higher level and understand that you might be wrong. And that's one thing I do with myself every morning. I tell myself that, Joachim, you're not right. You are mostly wrong in everything you do because I suffer from different biases. We all do. Confirmation bias, for example. What you see, you, you, your system one, your emotional system, draws conclusions which are not even close to the truth. And you need to be aware that that happens to you every single day, in every minute of the day that you're awake. You're, you are compromised when it comes to assessing your environment. And you need to pay attention to that because you're rarely right. You're mostly wrong about how you perceive the world. Anyhow, continuing to um, the fifth subcategory called modesty. High scores on the scales do not claim that they are better than other people. In some cases, this attitude may derive from low self-confidence or self-esteem. Nonetheless, some people with high self-esteem find immodesty unseemingly. Those who are willing to describe themselves as superior tend to be seen as disagreeable, arrogant by other people. And, well, I'm very modest. I'm very, very high in that because I am not right. I'm not better than other people. I am the same. I have the same opportunities like everyone else. The only difference is that I need to work for it. Uh, so do you. But I'm not right, I'm not better, I'm not worse than anyone else. We are all the same on this earth and we all have to put in the work to get where we want to be. If you want a healthy relationship, you need to understand psychology. 
otherwise how should you even go about understanding yourself in relations to another person and if you want to have a child you you better know how they interact with you and what's your purpose as a, as a mother or a father in order to raise that person for being a free adult further on and not causing harm to someone else anyhow coming to the conclusion of the six sub category called sympathy people who score high on the scales are tender-hearted and compassionate they feel they pain they feel the pain of others vicariously and are easily moved to pity Low scores are not affected strongly by human suffering, which means you can see people suffer or being harmed on the television and you don't feel anything, you don't get the reaction of it. They pride themselves as making objective judgments based on reason, connecting system two, the logical part of your decision system in your brain. That do requires sugar to function. That's why you're not very smart in the afternoon or just before lunch. They are more concerned with truth and impartial justice than with mercy. As you can see, um, agreeableness, if you're high in that regard, you're going to compromise yourself and in a relationship, you're the one that not, you're not going to get your way most of the time because you're going to agree to your partner's way if that person is middle or low in agreeableness. What's the problem with that? Well, when it comes to um, compromising, that's actually a war strategy. So it's a very ancient philosophy to compromise. When it comes to compromise, the, the table looks like this. If both people try and get what they want, nobody's going to get what they want because the two options are different when they're going to agree on doing one thing. If both people compromise, nobody of them is going to get their way. They get a partial uh, way of what they want. And that's not a win, that's a lose. But if one compromises and one gets what they want, at least one gets what they want in that scenario between two people. But to come back to the science about relationships and that you actually look for fairness in a relationship. We've, it's been tested. The people don't want, I'll give you one thing and you'll give me two or three things back. That's, that's anti-social behavior. That's narcissism. That's be having bad values. That using other people. They never stick in a relationship. They always break apart pretty quickly. And they show their color pretty quickly within three months because they can't hide themselves. Psycho uh, psychopaths, for example, they use and consume people within three months and then they move on to someone else because they use people. That's the basis of mental illness because they can't interact in a proper manner with other people. But you need to understand that compromising is not a good thing. You need to give and take and that's called reciprocity if reciprocity which is a fundamental psychological tool that people utilize without even knowing it i talked about uh, agreeableness when it's problematic here's the thing with being agreeable agreeable is is people getting used especially women when they can't disconnect from being agreeable after having infants. When the kids grow up, a woman needs to detach herself from being agreeable and reform her personality in that regard. There are actually companies out there that target just agreeable people to use them because they never say no at working more hours. They never question anything. They don't criticize their managers, so they use them and consume them. When they get ill, they just swap them out. You need, that's why being agreeable is not always a good thing because the world isn't a good place altogether. Agreeableness can put you in situations where, where things escalate beyond repair. Second World War. People agree to Hitler's uh, politics in the beginning 
and see where they ended up, which is not a good thing. But then again, Hitler is a good example that we're going to talk about in the next episode when we talk about conscientiousness. And there's proof building up to support that case and what was Nazism really all about. Anyhow, getting back to agreeableness, being agreeable should not be a priority. It is, however, one of the most fundamental and strongest human drives. It's called the need to belong. And having the need to belong to a group is very powerful in humans. On the other hand, it will make you suffer in the regards that you're going to compromise yourself and you're going to lose in that regard. Compromising your own values, what you stand for, is not always a good thing because that's a lose-lose way. You need also to win because people has, have a human, human uh, math mathematical equation that requires them to feel fairness. They need to feel that they're treated fairly which means I give you one thing and you give me something back. If people don't feel that, they will disconnect from a relationship, either if it's intimate or, or uh, friendly or work relationships, they will simply disconnect. One of the good things about um, understanding uh, being agreeable and, 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 and understanding the cost-benefit ratio that is one to one, except for psychopaths or uh, narcissists, for example, that use other people. They feel entitled to every all the time get what they want. That is that if you use it properly, which the majority, 80% of the hu human race does, uh, then the, the world continues and works properly. One of the fundamental psychological tricks that humans use and a good example of that is women's use of baking cookies and taking them to a workplace. That's called reciprocity and reciprocity is about I give you something for free and you will give me something back for free later on. Uh, it doesn't have, the, have to be the same or equal value but you need to give something back. And that's the basis of and foundation of relationships. That's how they actually are formed to begin with. So giving something for free is actually a good thing. Uh, and that's how connections and relationships are formed without you even knowing it. But pay attention to the ones that don't take a cookie or want to take something from you when you give it for free. That's a good red flag for anti-social behavior or I don't want to be in debt to you because I want to distance myself from you, which means I'm probably afraid of you in some sort of regard. Um, that also might imply trauma from before, hurt from a previous relationship or whatever. In any case, they are triggered by a pain circuit, neuroticism, and you need to pay attention to that. That can put you in a bad situation later on, because those people, I'm going to talk about that trait later on, and what the problems that resides from neuroticism. Anyhow, I hope this video gave you some insight into agreeableness and being disagreeable and how important is to understand both sides of the coin, so to speak. And why it's not always good to be agreeable? You also need to stand your ground and be disagreeable sometimes, even though you might not be popular when doing it. Especially today when polarization is starting to become a real bad thing and people, even professors, try and skew reality to some sort of popularity contest. And that is simply not okay. If you liked the video, like and subscribe. If you didn't like it, put the thumbs down if you like. Comment whatever you like. 
and I'll see you in the next one if you want to see more of me and about personality traits when I talk about conscientiousness, why it's good, why it's bad, what you should pay attention to. All right. Cheers, everyone.